This is a National Geographic virtual field trip. Today, we're celebrating some amazing women. Pushing boundaries in exploration. Welcome to National Geographic Base Camp in Washington, D.C. Our city is the indigenous homeland of several Native American tribes, including the Piscataway tribe and the Nkotchtank tribe. And my name is Krista Strahan. I am your tour guide on this virtual field trip. March is Women's History Month in the United States. During this time, we are encouraged to honor and celebrate the many contributions of women to American history and society. So today, we're meeting some extraordinary National Geographic explorers who are illuminating and protecting the wonder of our world and shaping history while doing so. To begin, we're traveling to the Ganges River in India where a scientist and conservationist is trying to tackle one of the Earth's most pressing problems, plastic pollution. Food wrappers, water bottles, bottle caps. What's on land can be washed directly into the ocean. we think about this mismanaged waste on land, it is easy to think, well, you know, that's not in the water right now. I don't have to worry about that. If our waste is ending up in the ocean, we must be doing something wrong on land. My name is Jenna Jambeck. I'm a co-lead of the Sea to Source Plastic Expedition, and this issue is a life's dedication for me. Realizing that plastic is ending up in our ocean has led us to thinking about what are the sources? Can we identify them? And really, it's to come up with those interventions to reduce the quantity of waste and plastic entering our waterways. We are starting off with the Ganges River to explore this issue from sea to source. The expedition started in the Bay of Bengal, in Bangladesh. From there, it's an epic journey all the way to the Himalayas, where we're ending. We want to stop plastic from getting into our waterways. Working along a river is going to bring us closer to understanding how we can do that. We really need to see it holistically, looking at air, water, sediment, land, and social interaction. We started with this iconic river, but this is building a method, building a system to analyze rivers around the world globally. What's on land can either be washed or blown directly into a waterway. On the land team, we are on the ground collecting data on waste and litter that we see, as well as potential sources of that litter. To do that, we're using a tool that we developed eight years ago called Marine Debris Tracker. And this is a mobile app that is available to everyone to identify every piece of litter that you see. It's important that we have things identified specifically so we can kind of look at this like forensics where we can explore why and how, and then that's where we can get at the source and prevent it ending up on the ground. Even though a retail bag and a takeout food bag have the same material from a polymer standpoint, they're very different in terms of the behavior that's causing them to be littered on the ground. To log it in the app, I'm going to go to our item category, which is food plastic, and then here's retail bag. I'll just click add, and there we go. Part of our methodology is developing these transects, which are 100 meter lengths. Every five meters, you can put down a quadrat and take a photograph and then use image recognition later to identify how much plastic you're seeing within those quadrats. This basically develops a litter profile for each community.
what's really cool is we can put restaurants, stores, waste bins, so we can get a better understanding of what spatially is going on within the system and the litter. In this community, there was a store at one end, and a lot of the waste was ending up on the ground. And so we found this high density, and so that's somewhere where you could then target potential interventions within this area, specific population, and specific infrastructure needs within that area. It's such a powerful tool to be able to pull in that data immediately to a map. Debris Tracker was really developed as this citizen science tool. We really wanted it to empower people to be able to collect this data and communicate this data to others. Because this goes into a global database that we can access and use, we can get a bigger picture around the world of what we're seeing. The more data we have, the more robust of analyses that we can do. With the disappointment of seeing litter at the source of this river in the Himalayas, it's a huge opportunity knowing we made it and then we can think about what kind of interventions can happen. That's an amazing experience to feel like you can collect data, present it, communicate it, and then changes can happen. I'm especially optimistic about the next generation being able to take this up and change our entire system and really protect our waterways and our ocean. That next generation that Jenna just mentioned, that's you. You're the ones with the power to help solve this problem. And Jenna is going to tell us how. Welcome, Jenna. Hi, Krista. So glad to be here with you. Now, Jenna, where are you right now? Well, I'm actually at my home in Athens, Georgia. Uh, but I wanted to let you know I have been going out for the past few weeks and cleaning up litter in my own little neck of the woods here. So even though I'm not out in the field uh, doing field work, I'm still doing that kind of work right here in my own backyard. That's great. Now, Jenna, you're approaching the issue of plastic pollution in such an interesting way. By identifying the source of where the pollution comes from and taking steps to prevent plastic from becoming trash in the first place, what gives you hope about this approach in particular? Well, I think this approach is, is really cool because we look at the issue upstream. Mm. Um, so not just sort of at the end of the pipe, so to speak. So thinking about plastic pollution, it's a really kind of big issue, complex with all kinds of interconnected parts. Yet I feel like this approach is not overwhelming because we can think of our sort of our what seem like small actions connected to many others and the synergistic impact they have. Um, but I also think it makes me hopeful because I've seen so much change happen in this space over the last 20 years. We've made a lot of progress, yet research shows we still need to do more. And so I think the key is that so many people care about this issue now and their support for solutions is really growing rapidly and the tide seems to be turning. So the Ganges River expedition that you co-led sounds like it was very informative. Tell us a bit more about the problems facing the river and what you were able to accomplish while you were there. Well, the expedition was an absolutely incredible experience. Um, I'd love to acknowledge my co-lead, Heather Coldaway, and the amazing in-country partners we had in India and Bangladesh. The team represented four different countries. Uh, there was about 18 of us traveling together at the same time along the whole river, which stretched over 2,000 kilometers. We were an interdisciplinary group, so we had, uh, we had engineers, we also had scientists, uh, we had social scientists. So it was, it was an amazing group. We worked in sort of three main areas, uh, the water and air team, the land-based team, and then a socioeconomic team as well. We found on the land team that, you know, litter doesn't necessarily always correlate with where people are. Um, what we also found is that infrastructure, so like actually, you know, mechanisms to manage waste make a big difference in terms of, of where we found litter and that there are definitely underserved communities along the river 
as well. Now I want to talk about something that's really cool. Let's, let's talk about your app, the Marine Debris Tracker. So can you explain what citizen science is and the goal of this app and how students can get involved? Absolutely. Um, so citizen science really means that any community member at all can really contribute to a scientific endeavor. So Debris Tracker is basically a mobile app and a platform. Um, and so there's a portal with a website. So the mobile app's free. Um, and basically, you report when you see litter in the environment. And so we really wanted it to be a useful tool for sort of anyone to use. You can use it sort of when you're walking your dog or heading to school. Um, but then we also use it as our major tool for research. So we use it along the Ganges River. Uh, we used it um, recently along an expedition on the Mississippi River as well. And so any research that we do around the world, we also use it. So there's been almost five and a half million items that have been reported since wow. we started the app. You can think about the data collection with sort of these three guiding questions. The first one is, what is it? So we really want to be specific about what we identify in the environment, the items. And then you can start to think about those upstream solutions. How did it get here? Why is it here? And then what can we do about it? And that's how we sort of target our, our thoughts around collecting the data. And last thing, I understand that the April edition of the National Geographic magazine features your story. Can you tell us about that? Sure. Um, I'm really excited for the story to come out myself. I mean, Laura Parker is an incredible writer. Um, National Geographic is known for making maps, so I'm thinking there should be some really good maps in there. And the photographs, Sarah Hilton, who's an amazing photographer, was with us on the expedition taking photographs, and so I know there will be some really powerful images in the story. And people will really be able to see all of the different um, components of the expedition and the team members as well. Well, I can't wait to see it. Thanks so much. This has been wonderful. Thanks for joining us, Jenna. Thanks so much for having me. Okay, here's a question I want all of us to ask ourselves. What can I do to help reduce plastic in our waterways and ocean? Take a second to write down what you can do or turn to your neighbor and share some ideas. This is a problem that we can all help solve. One thing my family is doing is using metal straws instead of plastic straws. Our metal straws are super colorful and fun to use, and we can wash and reuse them. No more plastic straws in the trash. There are tons of ways to illuminate and protect the wonder of our world. Let's see how a few more women are making their mark. I'm a marine biologist and an ocean educator. Paleontologist. Astronomer. I study nuisance rodents. Lemurs in the wild. I specialize in fossil hunting in caves. I am a geographer and glaciologist and National Geographic explorer. I am part of the next generation of women that have to make sure that this place survives. We have the opportunity to guide, care, to live in harmony with nature. That's really important. I'm fighting to protect environment, fighting to protect rights of peoples. And yes, I individually have the power to affect a positive change out of that. The thing is, we have no idea where the next scientific discovery is going to come from. There are thousands of planets out there waiting to be discovered. Living laboratories all around us. It takes more than one person to change the world, but I think some people do some pretty incredible stuff. If you see a problem in the world that you think needs solving, then go out there and make that difference. No one can stop you, and I believe in you. Wow, I hope.
hope that inspired you because I'm feeling pretty pumped. Our next two National Geographic Explorers have had the privilege to work with almost every scientist you just saw in that video. Please welcome Claire Fiesler. Claire, give us a wave. Fantastic, and Gabby Salazar. Hi, Gabby. Hi. Now, before we talk about your collaboration with all these amazing scientists, can you each tell us a little bit about your background and your work? So Claire, why don't you go first? Well, I'm a National Geographic Explorer, of course, uh, but my kind of two trades are photography and marine ecology. And I got into kind of ocean science growing up on the Jersey Shore. Contrary to popular belief, the Jersey Shore is very wild. <laughs> Amazing seabirds, marine mammals. It really in, uh, inspired me to eventually go into the field. And I've kind of zigzagged between media and journalism and, and science for most of my career. And I feel really blessed to have done both. And, and my, my specialty is coral reefs. Also, I do some work on marine mammals, but I consider myself uh, kind of a, an ocean scientist, probably speaking. Well, thanks so much, Claire. And Gabby, we'd love to learn more about you. So I am also a photographer. I started taking photos of nature when I was really young. I was just 11 years old. And since then, I've gone on to become a conservation photographer. So I take photos of environmental issues and challenges around the world and try to tell stories about them to help inspire people to care. And most recently, I've gone back to school and I'm now um, a doctoral student where I actually use different social sciences to understand how people uh, react to environmental marketing. So how they respond to different images of nature or videos or environmental education programs. And it's all in this kind of effort to inspire people to act in ways that are better for nature and the environment and for people. Okay, so that's amazing. How did you two first meet then and start to collaborate? Well, we actually met through the National Geographic Society since we're both National Geographic explorers and we we had our first grants from the society over 10 years ago. Uh, and we met at um, an event at down at headquarters and we knew we were both interested, I think, in science communication and in talking about and inspiring more women to get into science. And at the time I was doing a... a a photography project on women in science in North Carolina, where I was going to graduate school. And Gabby had heard about the project and approached me about collaborating. And then from there, we, uh, we, we kind of thought, you know, this could be a really good book for, for, young, for young audiences. And it, it kind of really evolved in a really natural way. And, you know, Gabby and I have been friends ever since. Well, I love that you're colleagues and friends, and I also love that National Geographic events are bringing people together for this important work. Um, and you've worked with many of the scientists that we saw in the video. Can you tell us about your project and what inspired you to pursue it? Absolutely. So we have been working for almost four years now, I think, on a uh, book for kids, um, really targeted at 10 to 14 year olds, but we think anybody can enjoy it. It's called No Boundaries, 25 Women, Explorers and Scientists Share Adventures, Inspiration and Advice. And it features the stories of and, and advice from women from 25 different scientific disciplines. And I think we really wanted to do this because we wish we'd had this book when we were growing up. What do you think, Claire? If I was going to summarize our book in one, in one word, it's persistence. And each of these women have persisted through a significant struggle or obstacle. And each of those women's stories kind of represent a different type of, you know, struggle or obstacle to persist through to, to, to make a difference. Now, can you tell us about a scientist from the book that really stood out to you, Claire? Um, well, I will say that I'm really partial to a woman named uh, Nora Shockey, and she's an Egyptologist. She's an archaeologist. An Egyptologist is someone who studies the history of Egypt and its unique past. And she's also Egyptian. She, you know, she lives there. And what I love about her work is that while everyone else is studying the pharaohs of Egypt, she studies, you know, antiquity. She studies the past, but she studies like the common you know, the common people of the time, the everyday people. 
And I love that, but her story is really about failure and normalizing failure. And she, I think, failed with getting permits like three or four times. Mm. She she is a National Geographic Explorer, but she failed, you know, getting a grant multiple multiple times. And she just kind of persisted, even though it was uncomfortable. And even though her work wasn't the typical type of work, you know, it wasn't mainstream, you know, Egyptology. And she's forced her own path. And I just, I love that because I feel like I've had, you know, I think maybe people will look at me and say, oh, she's an accomplished explorer and, and she wrote a book. But I've had plenty of failures in my career and we could, you know, how much time you got, like we could talk about them all day. And I just feel that I, I, um, I don't do a good job. I think kind of talking about the failures and she really does. And I just love her story. Yeah, and so many people watching, you know, from teachers to students can relate to that, failing and trying again and, and trying and continuing to persist. So that's a good example. And Gabby? Well, there are so many wonderful stories, uh, but one that I think I really love um, is Dr. Patricia Wright's story. She's a primatologist, she studies lemurs, and she works on the island of Madagascar, of course, where lemurs live. So that's a great start. Yeah. But what I love about her story is that uh, she really talks about kind of her evolution of her career over time. So, you know, she doesn't know exactly what she wants to be or that she wants to be a primatologist when she's a kid. And I think a lot of us feel the pressure to know what we want to do, like when we're kids and we just want to have an exact linear path there from, you know, that idea to that ultimate career. And Dr. Wright, instead, you know, she works as a social worker before she even goes back to school to study primatology. And then she becomes a scientist. And then when she's working in Madagascar, she realizes that a lot of these lemurs that she's come to love through her research are, you know, in danger of extinction because of environmental issues. And so then she becomes a conservationist. And I think it's a really great story that I relate to because it reminds me that we can always learn and grow no matter what stage we are at in our careers. That's such an amazing lesson. And you had me at lemurs and Madagascar right out the <laughs> gate. Um, last question. The title of your book is No Boundaries. What advice would you give to our students about how to aim high and achieve their goals? I think a piece of advice I would have given is to not just not not necessarily follow your passion. You need to be passionate. That's that's the starting point. But what will drive you in the long term, I do think, is kind of persistence and patience. And so start with passion. But along the way, you really need to grab hold, hold of these other virtues of like persistence and patience and kind of trust in yourself that it will work out and lean on those, you know, um, and I think that, that is the persistence really is kind of the secret sauce of, of behind the success of all these women um, in this book. And a lot of them, you know, are, are still striving towards, you know, their highest dreams and goals. But I think to what, you know, to do what they've done so far has really taken those two things is patience and persistence. Wow. Yeah. Passion, persistence, and patience. It's fantastic. Mm -hmm. Gabby? Well, I think for me, a big theme that comes out of the book and has been a big theme in my life is the importance of friendships and mentors. And so I think find people that you can talk with about your ideas, whether it be a peer like Claire and I working together, I think we've pushed each other to make this into a better project and to oh, do yeah, more work. <laughs> and I think it's so important, right? And, you know, you don't have to work alone and also look for people who are in the careers that you want to pursue and ask them for advice. And I think for the most part, if you approach people with an open mind and good questions and passion, they will go out of their way to help you along your path. This is all such great advice. Gabby and Claire, thank you so much for joining our field trip today. We really appreciate this. Th thank you so much. Thanks. Thank you. We'll share more info about the book at the end of the field trip. But right now, here's something to think about. What women have inspired you in your life? And how would you tell their story? Think about this for a few seconds. inspires me is my friend Louise.
Louise is a wife, mother of four, including twins. She's a businesswoman, an activist, and on top of all that, she finds time to celebrate her friends' accomplishments. She's basically the person I want to be when I grow up. Well, for our final visit today, we're heading to California, where a National Geographic young explorer is studying the vast possibilities of gray water. Four years ago, I saw firsthand the crippling effects of drought. That's something you would think is happening in a third world country, but it happened right here in California, in the United States. And it made me really want to do something to help. I'm the founder of the nonprofit, The Gray Water Project. Gray water is any lightly used water from sinks, showers, laundry, water that you've used once in your home, but you can use again. I've spent countless hours running tests just to make sure that gray water is safe. What I found is that yes, we really can use it. It's a viable solution. I want to make water recycling just as normal as paper or plastic recycling. I've created a curriculum to teach K through 12 students about gray water reuse that has been implemented in 90 schools. With the support of National Geographic, I hope to add more languages and take it to countries worldwide. My name is Shreya Ramachandran, and I'm extremely excited to be a National Geographic Young Explorer. Such an amazing project. I am so excited to have Shreya here with us. Welcome, Shreya. Hi, how are you doing today? Fantastic. Well, thanks so much for joining us. Now, recycling water is a great idea, and you have big ideas about how to do it. What water can we reuse and how? That's a really awesome question. And the way I like to think about it, there's three types of water classified based on how it's used. There's white water, which is clean drinking water, the kind of water that comes out of your tap. And then there's black water, which is like water that you flush down your toilet. You don't want to reuse black water. However, everything in the middle is gray water. That's water from sinks, showers, baths, laundry. Basically, any water that's been used once in your home and can be used again is gray water. And that can make up up to 60% of the used water in your home. Wow. So gray water can be reused for a lot of non-potable uses like toilet flushing and also irrigation. And it's very versatile and really an underutilized resource. Wow, so there's lots of opportunity there for reusing this water. Now, mm -hmm. what has been the most important lesson you have learned on this project? You know, I didn't start out thinking I'm going to create the Gray Water Project. I'm going to start a nonprofit. Really, I just saw a challenge in my community and in the world that I wanted to do something about. And before I started the Gray Water Project, I did several years worth of gray water research. I put in a lot of time and an effort, and it was just something that I cared about, and I kept moving forward with it. And I think. I've learned that through persistence and effort, you can really achieve anything that you set your mind to. And I've been doing this since quite a young age. And I want any young people listening to know that if there's a change that you want to see happen in the world, then your actions and your voice matters and is more influential than you could possibly imagine. So go out there and get them. I love that. Find something you care about and keep moving forward. Shreya, that's fantastic advice for everyone watching. Now, how can our students learn more about helping to conserve water in their own communities? The great thing about water conservation and gray water reuse is that they are practices that can be implemented by anyone anywhere in the world. So I'd encourage people to start small, look into your own home's water use, can I take shorter showers? Can I use gray water for irrigation? Maybe I can check for leaks. Just being conscious of our own water use, taking those habit forming actions to reduce our use, and then sharing what you're doing with others so you can inspire others to join you on this journey. 
And if people are interested in getting more involved, you can become an ambassador for the Greywater Project. And I can give you the tools and resources that you need to help build a more sustainable water future and make a difference in your local community. So it's pretty cool that some of the answers, some of the solutions for this start right at home. They really do, yes. So and this thank issue you is so a much life dedication for joining for us. Uh, we really appreciate you taking the time. Thank you so much for having me. This has been such a great field trip. I hope these incredible scientists inspired you to go out and explore the world for yourself. As explorers Claire and Gabby told us, there are no boundaries. Remember to celebrate the special women in your life this month and every month. See you next time and keep exploring.